For blood test number seven in 2024, when using Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator, PhenoAge, we saw that my biological age was 15.2 years younger than the chronological. So what might be contributing to these data? So let's start off with prescription meds. And for those who are familiar with the channel, the first shouldn't be a surprise. I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my mid-20s, so I've been taking levothyroxine for about half of my life. More specifically, 137.5 micrograms per day. The second, though, may be a surprise. It won't be a surprise for people who follow me on Patreon, but it may be a surprise for everybody else. And I started taking rapamycin, one milligram per day for seven days. Now, before many start to think that rapamycin had some impact on blood test number seven's results, it's important to note when I did that seven-day experiment. So the 49-day period that corresponds to test number seven went from September 6th through October 24th of 2024. So that 49-day period is immediately after test number six, and it lasted through the day before test number seven. Now, I did the rapamycin experiment starting on September 10th. So I had about a one-month washout with no rapamycin, so it's unlikely that rapamycin had any impact on these results. So why did I include it? Rapamycin is a known antifungal, and for whatever reason, candida antibodies, more specifically IgG, have been uh, relatively elevated for all tests in 2024. So I took rapamycin to see if I could bring candida IgG levels down towards the lower end of the reference range, which it didn't, unfortunately. So I took it out. I still have a supply of rapamycin, so I'm open to doing that experiment at another point. But for now, rapamycin is out of the approach. Which then brings us to supplements. And here too, for those who are familiar with the channel, the first shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, I supplement with vitamin D about eight to nine months out of the year as I currently live in Boston and I can't get adequate full body sun exposure. So for the 49 day period that corresponded to test number seven, 2000 I use a vitamin, vitamin D for all of the 49 days. The second is nicotinic acid, very low dose, 50 to 60 milligrams per day. And I took that for 36 of the 49 days that corresponded to test number seven. And I, I did that specifically to increase NAD or keep NAD from being closer to the low end of my range. Now, rather than just assuming that taking nicotinic acid or any supplement will impact a given biomarker, I actually measured it. So on the same day as test number seven, I sent blood to Ginfinity for NAD analysis. And on the test number seven day, October 25th, NED levels were 31.7 micromolar. So what does that mean? Let's put that into per perspective. So for test number six, I supplemented with nicotinic acid, low dose nicotinic acid for a similar percentage of days, 28 out of the 42 days that corresponded to test number six. But NED levels on that, on that same day as test number six were relatively lower, 21.1 micromolar. But nonetheless, we can see the test number seven a little bit higher than test number six. But then the big question is, or a question could be, if, if I supplemented with the same amount of days of using nicotinic acid, why aren't NED levels the same? That seems 10 micromolar is about a 30% amount of variability. Well, it's important to note when I took the nicotinic acid. So for the five days before testing for test number six, I didn't take any nicotinic acid. But for all of those five days and beyond, for test number seven, I included nicotinic acid. So we can see that NED levels are very sensitive to taking NED precursors for at least the five day period before testing. All right, that's it for supplements, which then brings us to diet. What diet composition, what diet composition corresponds to test number seven's results? And that's what we'll see here. This is the average daily dietary intake for that 49 day period that corresponds to test number seven. And for those who don't know, I weigh everything with a food scale. I then enter that into chronometer, put that data into a spreadsheet. So these aren't estimations, but as close as one can get to actual intake. In terms of the food list, that's what's shown here. I ate 54 different foods, and this list is ranked in grams with, the, with three exceptions. Green tea, which is in ounces. And if you want to use what I use, which is organic loose leaf green tea from Japan, there's a discount link in the video's description. And then two others on this list are not list listed in grams, including ice cream and popcorn. And we'll get more into that into the cheat day, cheat meals section of the video. But first, at this point in the video, I always ask, were, they, were there any experiments for this test? So the goal is to make small changes to the diet and supplements with the goal of uh, improving weak spots, optimizing weak spots like lipoprotein A, Dunedin Pace, Horvath, homocysteine, DHEA sulfate, which seems like a long list, I know. 
But the goal is to make small changes to improve those biomarkers without blowing up everything else because a lot of my data is also youthful. So what were some of the experiments that I did for this test? Well, first, strawberry, I increased it from 319 grams up back up to 510. And I did that because for the last test, test number six, I cut total fructose intake, including strawberries. That wasn't uh, correlated with my best biological age or other biomarker data. So I increased strawberries back to where they were before test number six, relatively high 510 grams per day. I also increased sardines from 107 to about 143 grams per day. And I did that to test correlations for Horvath's epigenetic age and homocysteine. I also increased low fat yogurt. And for those who'll say, well, just go full fat, for whatever reason, dairy saturated fatty acids, if I eat dairy consistently and full fat, that's significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So unfortunately, full fat dairy has to be limited in my approach. So with that in mind, I do eat low fat yogurt. I increased it from eight grams per day, an average of eight grams per day to 117 for test number seven. And I did that to test the correlation with the nighttime respiratory rate which superficially may not seem like an important biomarker, but it's a biomarker of immune activation. So uh, I did that experiment and it may not have uh, made a dent, but nonetheless, I increased low fat yogurt to test that correlation. I also increased oranges from zero on the prior test up to 35 grams per day. And I did that to test its correlation with DHEA sulfate. I also increased cacao beans. And if you saw the Dunedin Pays video, you know why. You can see that I increased cacao beans from an average of one to about 12 grams per day. Cacao beans are significantly correlated with a lower MCV, which is a component of Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator phenoage. But in my case, they're also significantly correlated with lower lipoprotein A. And knowing that lipoprotein A is a part of the Dunedin Pays algorithm, I, I decided to test that correlation by increasing cacao bean intake. Now, another part of the lipoprotein A story in my case may be flax seeds. So flax seeds are a rich source of gamma tocopherol, which is one of the vitamin E isoforms. In my data, higher gamma tocopherol is significantly correlated with a higher lipoprotein A. And knowing that I want a lower lipoprotein A with the goal of slowing my epigenetic pace of aging, don't need a pace, I also cut flax seeds by a relatively small amount from 26 to about 16 grams per day. And in terms of... Uh, or, uh, Oysters, I added oysters into the approach. The oysters are a new addition. So for those who have been following the channel for a while, this is the first time they've been in the approach since 2015, since I started tracking diet. And that's not five grams per day where I just took a little bit every day. That's one 65 gram can of oysters per week. So why did I do that experiment? So oysters are a rich source of zinc, 59 milligrams per can. And for whatever reason, uh, zinc in my data, well, I shouldn't say for whatever reason, there are probably many mechanistic ways that zinc can be involved in improving some of these biomarkers, including candida antibodies, IgG, but also taurine. So I, I added oysters into the approach to increase zinc with the goal of potentially impacting candida, uh, IgG levels, and taurine. Which then brings us back to ice cream and popcorn, which are a portion of the cheat meal section of the video. So they were clearly cheat meals. And for those who don't know, immediately after blood testing, I don't pay much attention to meeting my food macro and micronutrient goals. So I kind of, you know, eat whatever I want, uh, you know, within reason and while trying to stick to calorie goals. And I do that for a couple days, you know, two to three days at most following the blood test. And then I shut it off. No more, no more junk, completely sticking to the whole foods, clean, diet until the next blood test. And using that approach, it keeps me satiated as I can eat a little bit of junk, but then I also don't crave it after I've had it. So it's it, it, it works for me. But in terms of the cheat meals, I also added sugar. So there too, that's not 0.8 grams per day. That's 40 grams on one of the days following the blood test. I added that to a mix of macadamia nuts, cacao beans, and dates, which I blended all together. But I should say that wasn't as satiating as some other things that I eat on cheat days, including uh, homemade Reese's peanut butter cups. In terms of junk calories, the Oreo ice cream, well, the, the ice cream sandwiches were Oreo ice cream sandwiches. In hindsight, it probably wasn't ice cream. On the box, it said frozen dairy dessert, so or frozen dessert, so uh, probably a mix of just chemical stuff that maybe you know has the texture of ice cream. In hindsight, that was a bad idea. It tasted pretty good though. Uh, and following test number seven, uh, I had you know homemade ice cream. I made homemade ice cream with heavy whip, whipping cream. So. Stay tuned for that update uh, in the next video update uh, for test number eight. 
All right, so in terms of junk calories, 840 from the ice cream sandwiches, 220 from popcorn. Technically, pop, the popcorn isn't junk. It was uh, air pop, not oil pop, but still I've included it on the list. And then the sugar contributed 155 calories. In total, junk calories were 1215. And when dividing that by all of the calories consumed for this 49-day period, it's 1.2% of total calories. In other words, the diet was 99% clean, which is correlated with that 15-year younger biological age. Now, in terms of how much leeway to go there, in terms of how clean does one need the diet to be to have their best biomarker results, I haven't played around with that. I think that's a slippery slope. If I start to go to, you know, eat foods that are less clean, maybe I go to 3 4%, maybe I start to crave junk food more, and I don't want that to happen at all. For me, 1% to 2% at most junk, uh, keeping it really high clean works well for long-term adherence. All right, so this list is ranked in grams. What about ranking foods based on calorie intake? And that's what we'll see here. These are the top 10 foods for average daily calorie intake for that 49-day period that corresponded to test number seven. And this list is generated by Chronometer. If you want to track your own diet using Chronometer, there's a discount link in the video's description. So atop the list, as it has been for many tests, is sardines. Sardines are my top source of calories. And then without going through everything on the list, seven of the 10 foods that are on this list were the same as they were for test number six. So again, not trying to blow up the system, make small changes to the diet while keeping everything else close to the same to make, you know, to optimize a few biomarkers without blowing up everything else. In terms of foods that entered, it was beets, coconut butter, and pistachios. And for foods that left the top 10 relative to test number six, corn, oats, and chickpeas. And in terms of why corn and oats, uh, I reduced them for this test. It was to do another experiment with total fat intake, but we'll get into that in a second. All right, so what macronutrient composition we covered foods co corresponds to test number seven. So first, in terms of average daily calorie intake, 2130 per day, and that's close to, but not my lowest intake since 2015. Uh, lowest intake is 2076, and if you saw the lymphocyte video, or if you missed it, I'll link to that in the right corner, you'll know why. In terms of average daily protein intake, 102 grams per day, which is 19%, around 19% of total calories. Fat intake, shown here for test number seven, was 89.5 grams per day, which is about 38% of total calories. Now, for perspective, we'll pull up test number six data, and we can see that I purposefully increased fat intake from 82 to around 90 grams per day. Now, that might not seem like a big jump, but going too high for fat intake, for whatever reason in my data, is significantly correlated with more biomarkers, sorry, more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So I'm trying to make small increases to try to find the sweet spot, you know, the lowest, the lowest bottom, the bottom of the U shape, right? Not too low, not too high. What's the, what's the bottom of the U that optimizes more biomarkers than not? So in terms of where that fat increase came from, it was mostly from saturated fat from cacao beans. And, you know, you can see that there's about a seven gram increase there. We can also see the reduction in flax seeds led to less omega-3 test over test, 8.4 versus 9.5. I was able to keep omega-6 relatively constant, but it's not a perfect system of just making small changes and, and keeping everything else the same. As we can see, monounsaturated fat intake was about 5 grams less with this test relative to the last. All right, what about carb intake? So that's what we'll see here. Total carbs was about 265 grams per day, which seems like a lot. And I know I say this in each of these videos in, in series, you know, diet composition videos. But for those who don't know, total carbs equals uh, net carbs equals total carbs minus fiber. So average daily fiber intake for this test was 79 grams per day. When subtracting that from total carbs yields a net carbs of 188 grams per day. When multiplying that by four calories per gram, we get a net carb percentage of 35% net carbs. Now, in terms of calories, fiber also produces some amount of calories. That's because a fraction of total fiber is soluble fiber, which means that it's fermented by gut bacteria into short-chain fatty acids. In other words, a fraction of total fiber intake is converted into fat. So in terms of how much of that was convert converted into fat, 166 calories from fiber was converted into fat, and that's about 8% of total calories. So now we can see that the, the net macros that correspond to the 15 year younger biological age of about 46% fat, which includes the amount coming from fiber fermentation by gut bacteria, 35% net carbs, and 90% protein. Now, before leaving the total carbs, I also track sugar intake, but not total sugars because sugars aren't a homogeneous group. For example, glucose, fructose, sucrose, lactose, I mean, I can go down the list. There are many different sugars. 
but within that group, I track total fructose intake, with sucrose being half fructose. So when adding those two together, I track total fructose intake because a higher total fructose intake in my data is significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. For this test, total fructose intake was 58 grams per day, which is not my lowest. My lowest was for test number six. But as we saw for test number six, that wasn't a part of my best biomarker data. So I increased total fructose back to where it's been around 58 grams per day. I know that may seem like a lot, but that's about half as high as total fructose has been since 2015. So progress, albeit not perfection. All right, which brings us then to micronutrients. What micronutrient profile corresponds to this test? So we'll see the full list for vitamins and minerals. It may be hard to see the vitamins, so I'd recommend going full screen if you haven't already. And for anyone that's starting on this journey of tracking diet with the goal of optimizing biomarkers, I'd recommend at the very least, very least, making sure that you've got full RDA coverage for all vitamins and minerals. And if you go down the list, you can see that that's true. Uh, choline looks a bit low, but unfortunately, the uh, diet entry for sardines that I use in chronometer doesn't have a choline amount from the sardines. So when I manually add that in my own spreadsheet, I get the RDA for choline. But then taking that a step further, I'm also measuring plasma levels of choline in the Iola metaboloma kit, which is not low. So uh, even though choline is around the RDA, based on plasma levels, intake is only one side of that equation. My choline levels in plasma aren't relatively low, so that's good news. Now also note that many micronutrients are, are much higher than the RDA purposely much higher as I'm following their correlations with about 25 different biomarkers. And that doesn't include correlations with the epigenetics or metabolomics, just standard clinical chemistry biomarkers. And I use that data to guide the diet. So just as an example for some of the nutrients here that are much higher than the RDA or what's defined as an adequate intake are carotenoids. And that's because in at least a few papers, a relatively higher intake of carotenoids is significantly associated with a younger epigenetic age. So if you go down a list of alpha and beta carotene, beta cryptoxanthin, lutein and zeaxanthin, and lycopene, you can see that my intake of those carotenoids are relatively high. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon, where I include those biomarker correlations. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links, sorry, affiliate links that you can use to test yourself while also helping to support the channel, including ultalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests done, clearly filtered water filter, epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, NAD testing with Ginfinity, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also the DNA methylation test Grimage, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.